<laughs> so let's move it a little closer to home. I hope it's still interesting. Um, this is chapter 22. Excuse me. It looks like a short chapter. Okay. Uh, I picked it. It may not be the most powerful in terms of exactly everything of the experience, but it just felt like the right one. The road to town cut through the farm of our neighbor, Woody, a seemingly ubiquitous name in this neck of the woods. To the north was his orchard, including several acres of apple trees, leafy and green in summer, brown and sculpted in winter, filigree moss clinging to the bark. When we passed the orchard on our way to somewhere else, it was just another collection of fruit trees, part of the rural landscape, bigger than most, but no more remarkable than street lights in the city. Then we were invited to pick. Woody had more apples than he could use and generously offered us the opportunity to harvest whatever we wanted. Carol and I took him up on the offer, climbing into the branches on rickety wooded ladders. I staked out a tree and went higher than I liked, carrying a bucket to hold my harvest. This apple looks almost black, I called out. Have you ever seen one like this before? My reference for apples was limited to red delicious for eating and maybe something greener skinned and unnamed for cooking. Until now, apples were just apples and peaches were just peaches. Variety, sugar content, and lineage were never discussed, let alone displayed in a grocery store. If it was red, it was a red delicious, at least in name, if not flavor. High up in Woody's orchard, I plucked a globe from the bough above me and took my first bite of an apple fresh from the tree. My teeth pushed into the hard, crispy flesh, crushing the tiny interior cells. Crack, a chunk of firm white meat separated from the hole. Shifting the bite to the side of my mouth, I crunched down, releasing juice that bathed my tongue. Sweet or tart, the usual descriptors of apples were inadequate for the experience. What I tasted was the essence of living soil and fresh water. Rainwater, roots tapping the earth, leaves harvesting the sun, the psychedelic experience of apples without the drugs. I was Alice in Wonderland. Eat me, and I entered an alternate universe. Carol, take a bite. My apples are great. So are mine, she yelled back, her voice lightly muffled by the leaves of the tree in which her head had disappeared. Now I needed to taste them all. Looking around from my perch on the ladder, I spied another tree that beckoned with what seemed to be even a better variety. Like Eve, we always wanted more. That is the delight of fruit picking. Not stripping the branches, but searching for the holy grail of produce perfection. The biggest, fattest, bluest berries nestled so close that handfuls can be harvested in one grasp, or that golden red, gently fuzzed peach heavy on the branch, promising juice that will run down your arm when you bite into its sun-warmed meat. Here it was apples. Yielding to the siren call of the next, I moved my ladder and reached out again. This time for a large globe, green with red striations covering its shoulders. As I chomped on the fruit of this tree, I spied its neighbor hanging like a holiday direct decoration, pinkish red with a hint of yellow. Time to move my ladder again. On and on it went, more varieties that I knew existed, nameless but imprinted on my taste, buds, and memory. Beneficent Oregon was so very, very good to us. Woody's house was across the road from the orchard. He lived with his wife in a well-maintained but well-used ranch-style house that anchored a cluster of farm buildings. Behind the house were a corral and chutes for sheep shearing, some fenced land, and acres of open pasture that ran up and over the hills. On them grazed a few head of meandering cattle, a small herd of sheep, and a wild pony with her colt. Like many farms, the entrance to Woody's house was through the kitchen. In the center of the room was a round, heavily varnished wood table and three captain's chairs, lower and squatter than the ones in my parents' dining room. A practical white stove and refrigerator attested to years of use and an emphasis on utility. Sitting on the table, in pride of place, was an ever-present box of wheat thins, ready for a quick snack or maybe an offer of hospitality in case someone stopped by. That someone was frequently us. 
We were very sociable, and with no phones up the hill, communication took place face to face. Something was always happening at Woody's. Dropping by might yield an opportunity to help shear the sheep or slaughter a steer or peek at Woody's nudie magazine collection stored in a discarded refrigerator in his cluttered garage, where we also skinned and butchered, butchered that steer. Woody was no fool. He had a sense of drama himself, and we were audience as well as entertainment for him. Providing his own food, including killing it, was a way of life for Woody, not a novelty as it was for us. He may have had only a few cattle grazing on his hill, but they were definitely not pests. Inviting us to help shoot a steer in the head, behead it, cut off its hooves, and then hang the carcass from a steel hook, winched over a galvanized tub in his garage, was Professor S. Schoen. As carnivores, we knew we had the obligation to participate in de the death as well as the barbecue of our beef. Woody's offer was a challenge, a thrill, and an instructive lesson. I went because I wasn't going to be left behind. But after the chickens at Greedleaf, I knew my best shots were from a distance and with a camera. <laughs> there was, however, more to Woody's than adventure. There was also the ritual. Arriving at his house, a group of us would dis disengage from the communal, communal vehicle that was running that day. Woody would come out and exchange pleasantries, and his wife would invite us in to say hello. There in the kitchen was where the unspoken face-off, better known as who gets the wheat thins, began. <laughs> we were always hungry in that lone box of wheat <laughs> sitting right in the center of the table, already open, its wrinkled wax lining folded in on itself, looked mighty inviting. Carol, Clint, Stuart, Rocky, and I, along with whoever had joined us in the truck, would stand around making small talk. Our attention was not focused, however, on the words coming out of, out of our mouths, but on what we hoped to put in our mouths. <laughs> that golden yellow Nabisco box began to glow as the spiritual nexus of the room. <laughs> and clearly, when you are hungry, your spiritual functioning is not on its highest plane. <laughs> the delicious mix of sweet wheat and salt were conjured up until they were almost as real as the experience itself. I could taste the crackers, could feel the sharp edges of the little squares on my tongue, the tang of the salt as it dissolved, mixing in with the crunchy pieces that broke in my mouth into smaller and smaller fragments. And I knew that my fellow communards were salivating their own identical fantasy, over their own identical fantasy. The conversation may have continued, yep, looks like it'll be a warm summer and planted any tomatoes yet, but the real dialogue was within ourselves. Woody and his wife knew from past experience that if they offered the crackers, we would empty the box, leaving his wax paper innards crumbled and spent. They were done being generous. The wheat thins were theirs. <laughs> Nevertheless, those of us from up the mountain hoped, with an intention that was laser-like in its focus, that this might be the time when they would once again offer us a little hospitality. Woody and his wife, in an act of self-preservation, assiduously avoided looking at the crackers or making any mention of sitting down and staying a while. We knew it was fair, but our longing lingered. To befriend us had its downside. There were so many of us, and our needs were overwhelming. Once you opened the door, like locusts, we would strip the field clean. We lived in a Mikasa as Sioux Castle world. Why not just extend the boundaries of it? With no running water on our place, keeping clean was a challenge. Steam baths were wonderful, but they were not an everyday affair. Hey, stop by and visit when you come to town, an unsuspecting new friend would offer. Sure enough, we would appear with a freshly made loaf of bread or just our goodwill and joyous spirits. After hanging around and chatting, perhaps sharing a joint or two, inevitably the question would arise, hey, mind if I use your shell? <laughs> yeah, me too. I haven't been in days either. What was a hippo supposed to do? The boundary was crossed, and there we were, a little cleaner than when we started, 
but a little less light. <laughs> we gave, though, as good as we got. The unspoken trade was always our exotic lifestyle. We brought adventure, drugs, and the tantalizing aroma of projected sexual fantasies, functioning as dream catchers for those on the other side. We had crossed the line, and there was a bit of vicarious thrill for neighbors and friends to join us for a peek. <laughs> who had been working on something greasy and, and clean. Oh, yes. Well, Clint was a, Clint was a, 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 like an alchemist, and he was a master of mechanical things. He was a wonderful um, a, a, a carpenter, a creator of things, and, and, mecha and mechanically very strong. And he had resurrected, there's a picture, I, I don't think it's in the book because I didn't have releases for everybody's pictures and everything. So this, um, and he was always tinkering on something. So, and as you, you know, <laughs> We're living up there, there's no running water. So to get the water, you got to pump the water. You know, the joke was, every recipe started, you know, first you cut down a tree, then you chop the wood, you know. And, and, and um, you know, we've gone back, you know, as women, we've gone back and lost a lot of the independence we had. We sort of, because technology and the lack of it, started to define our lives. So Katrina, this, there were a couple that came from Greece who had been friends from architecture school. And she was meticulously clean, and she also had a four-year-old son, Kofia, Constantine. And so she was, um, she would, and they were living still in what was the main cabin, um, where I think the rest of us maybe had started to move out to tents because we hadn't built our cabins yet. So, you know, you have to boil the water, so she's washing some clothes or washing some, some uh, towels or something to make sure everything's clean. She's got them hung outside, and it's a, you know, a big labor, and she's got this little child. She's the only one with a child. She has an immense amount of work to do. And she tries to keep the main cabin clean because they're living upstairs in it, and there's people, we all ate in the same cabin, the central place. So she's hanging out to dry, and, and I, Kofi told me the story, because he, he's this, this little boy, he's looking out the window, he's incredibly loyal to his mother. And he said, and Clint, who had just finished working on the um, tractor to try to get it to do something, oh. yeah, he, you know, he then reaches up, he walks by, he reaches oh. up, takes down the white rag, and then wipes his hands, you know. And, and Kofi, got, they, they, and I remember he told me, he said, there's a little boy, just, I saw it happen. It was like my mom's artwork, you know, <laughs> <laughs> destroyed in just a casual. It's not a shop rag. There's no machine in the back to wash it. So sometimes, if just in this little child's eye, the sense of what the tension could be, and I'm sure for Katrina it wasn't easy, but for Clint, he just wasn't thinking. It wasn't me. Really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm happy to hear your memories and have other memories shared. Yes? As a transient, for the first time, I drove five miles up Forest Creek today. Uh, to the gravel. How much further were you? You know, you'd ha I, had, I would defer to Betsy for everything. I wish Steve was here. <laughs> Seven um, miles you were. About how, how many no, miles? It's at the oh, six, old six, house. six mile marker. Right. right. To the and turn. Turn. We, it's it's right right house. House. Yeah, and we tried going up there, but I think the logging road has, uh, the old road may be overgrown, and the, and the logging road has taken a new mm -hmm. route. And they have an iron gate across the road. Right, that's the bail on the road. Yeah, but they said you can walk. They said right. no vehicle. So we hiked up there, um, but we couldn't find it. Um, Steve might, or some other people, or maybe if we went back again and tried, you know, Wait, we, uh, yeah, some other I think that all the buildings got burned. I think Steve burned them. Well, from I think. From what I understand. One building, after, you know, I left, um, and then bit by bit, there were some things happened in the group came to an end, although Clinton Carroll owned the land and they stayed there on and off. And they went down to Los Angeles and I think Patrice and Regis stayed up there for a while. And I think the main cabin burned at some point, but I think some of the other cabins were maybe um, a pilfered to, to for other right. reasons. Um, and the cabin I had, I think there's a picture in there, and there's a, a, the, there's a, on the top there's the main cabin when we first, when it was cleaned out, right, a little bit after we first got there. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, we, Steve, there's a picture of a beautiful cabin over on the other side. Steve built that. Mine was a tar paper shack. I thought it was the most fabulous place in the world. You know, I built it, but I didn't build it. Everybody helped me, but I had to, you know, be the, the, the drudge there. And, you know, I remember just looking there and seeing that, you know, the wonderful moss you have, that crinkly little light green moss on the, you know, the, the um, you know, inside, because those, those were the framing poles. 
I just lying there looking at that. I thought, you know, my secondhand windows that are put in odd pieces and you still see things like that around. I think, this is the best place. In the I just love this. Still, so, out of all the places I've lived in, it's one of my favorite places. If, if there's um, one person who would know where that was, pardon? it would be Rod Morrell. Rod yeah, Rod yes. yeah. He knew that country better than anybody I ever met. And Rod used to visit us. He'd come up yeah. and, like, he wouldn't He'd come show up in his car. Up yeah, yeah he'd, ask, he'd arrive in his cab. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and uh, he'd, he'd come by for a visit. Yeah. And that's what was amazing. Is I, coming from the city, kept thinking, oh, no one will know we're here. No one will know anything. I realized it's just a neighborhood with bigger backyards. <laughs> <laughs> and when you come a calling, you come a calling in your cat. You know? <laughs> or as, um, you know, as Joe said, they hiked, you know, they spent a whole day hiking over the mountain to come visit us. Yeah. Yeah. So I wish I could be more exact for myself as well as you. Any other questions? Anything, memories? At, yes. At the height, how many people were living up there? And then uh, do you still have contact with each other? You know, I would say we were a core of about 10 people. In summer, of course, well, what happened is when we came from the farm at, that was outside Eugene, that was in Greenleaf over, uh, there, I think it's Route 36, um, near Triangle Lake over around there, you know, we still, everybody had a little leftover money, we were on a farm, it's electricity and plumbing, people are coming through, it's party time. You know, so in the summer we would have 20 people maybe or something like that. And then there'd be hangers on, and then when we moved up here, and it was winter, there's that one cabin that Shorty had left, and but he had already abandoned, left it, so I think that when the, when the property was purchased by Clinton Carroll. It was knee deep in old paperback west, westerns, and the windows had been blown out, and everything was molding, you know. So we got it, and they got it, and we got it in shape, and then we all slept on a loft and we put, put, you know, wood across the rafters. And all of a sudden, you know, there's two women with young babies, and, you know, there's no disposable diapers, and there's no money. And when you start rolling those diapers and chopping down the tree, and there were single mothers, you know, and who's going to, you know, and they're not ready. They were not exactly tree choppers themselves, which wasn't to say the women weren't. But they weren't. Well, you sort of separated, you know, the wheat from the chaff there. And people sort of by, you know, started to disappear. And some, and even some other people, they said, well, it's a little harder than we expect. We're looking for a spiritual thing. Maybe we can't find it here. And so we went down to, you know, probably about 10 of us. And we were an international group. Uh, my husband had been in the States, but he was from Indonesia, myself, Clinton Carroll, this family from Greece, um, uh, Clint's brother, uh, Rocky, who came off a bus, maybe somebody else here and there. And there weren't a lot of women. There, I, there weren't, when my husband left, I was the only single woman there. It was man's country. It was just man's country. Um, but I'm grateful to all the people, men and women there, that helped me because I couldn't have done it without. Are your photographs cataloged and available online? Can we, if, do you? Um, you know, I haven't put them online. I, I, and I have some. Um, they're in the book. Some of them. Uh, I would love. To, you know, I think that I would love to make maybe make them available. They're a piece of history, you know. And and if I could make them available to you in some way, I just have to make sure I have releases. And I have changed names in the book somewhat just to protect people where it felt necessary. Um, uh, that's an idea for me. That's an idea for me. Did I? Was there another half of your question I didn't answer? Yeah. Do you uh, still have contact? Are you yeah. Still friends or just kind of fall apart? Or? Um. Well, some people like the guy Rocky. I read in Corvallis, and he lives around there. And he came and it was so sweet to see him. Uh, Katrina and Paul Sparrows, who were from Greece. Their son lived in Portland. I used to see him, and I traveled to Greece, and they came and visited me here, and I still email with them. Very nice. close with them, very dear with them. Um, Clint Carroll, you know, I, I ended up, when my, after my husband left, my second husband became Clint's brother, Stuart, who was up there, and we all lived in Los Angeles, blocks from each other. Um, you know, we were both going to write together, and we had a little falling out over it, so that there's some, a couple of rough bumps over time. Um, uh, who else? Um, so some of the people still, and, and, and uh, there's some people I contacted and interviewed people when I did the book. I originally wanted everybody to write their own story, so you get a communal telling of a communal yeah. tale, but it didn't work out that way, so I ended up just interviewing people. Um, and uh, everybody was wonderful. It feels like you've known everybody forever, you know, that um, there's still that connection. Yeah. Uh, when, did, when did you meet Steve? 
Steve, we were living at Greenleaf. Okay. And um, the, he was living there with a group of maybe five, six, seven people. And they had been living in cabins there, but the cabins, once there was a fire there. Yeah, because yeah, our fire. candles were left unattended. Or something. <laughs> and then they were ended up living in tents. The guy who owned the property that they were renting let them still live there in tents. And um, uh, then when we moved down, to, when we moved here, Ledbetter joined us. Yeah, came with you. Yeah, came with, came with us. But well, we were friends with them. There's like an underground of all these other people. Any other questions? Any other memories you want to share? Yes. I think I remember a child being born. Now getting, how did that go? The, here in Lineless? Um, right? Yes, well, well, both Carol and Katrina got pregnant. And so they both had their babies here. I think in the hospital in Vanda. Oh, um, and after there's stories of other people who could tell about those around here. That, um, <laughs> but I think uh, Carol, I drove in with her, Clint and Carol, I drove in with them, and it was a long delivery, and David was born there, Huckleberry was born there. But Katrina went into labor. Clint, all, Clint always had a truck that ran. <laughs> and Paul and I share, ultimately, I, before I got my truck, Paul and I shared a car. It was an old old. It wouldn't make it up the hill. The car went way, way down. And I think that it was a huge rainy night, and Katrina goes into labor, and they've got to go get Clint to see if they can get his truck, and who are they going to leave Pokey with? So they get Carol up there, and you've got to you know, hike down the hill in the rain, you've know, got to hike back up the hill in the rain, you know what I mean? And, and then they finally, uh, I don't know, Clint's truck isn't working, and they somehow they get another vehicle, and they drive you know, down the hill, and I remember it's storming. I, I wasn't on the trip, but I remember them telling it to me. Storming, the wind is blowing, it's dark, you know. I think he saw this you know, this um, deer or something, some of elk or something, jumped in front of the car. But uh, it was a sort of a dramatic, you know, there you are up there. And it was, and they made it. And But Katrina said, she stayed there as long as they would laugh. <laughs> she said, you know, it was clean, it was heated, there was water, she was taken care of. She said, this is great. <laughs> um, but it was very hard to be um, a mother up there. You know, when they came back, um, Carol had a cesarean, Katrina didn't, but you know, there's an outhouse. There's no running water, there's no heat, you know what I mean? You're not feeling well, this is this and that, whatever's happening, you know what I mean? And, and Carol was a new mother first time around, and, um, you know, it was just a little harder, but, you know, it was no harder than many other people have lived, or, or, you know, but we had given up certain things, and then and I think sometimes when the children came, then the question became, where can we live or how can we live? For me, it became a question of money, because I was. Yes. Yeah. Can you tell us more about the section in the book about working at Pitch's Tavern? Uh -huh. yeah, right. yeah, I, I, I mean, that may have been it. You know, we were trying to find it today. You know, at some point, the app ran out of money. You know, I had picked brush, taken it down to the shed. I think the shed was in Port Orford or something. I can't. Yeah. Here? I think so. Yeah. And the, the irony is the brush that I picked would go down to Florence in Los Angeles and up and down California. I think of that. Uh, uh, so I needed to earn money. And I thought, okay, I give up. You know, I'm getting loans are due from my college education. Um, I've done everything I can figure out. We scrimped and saved, done everything. And, and Clinton, Carol and I used to just die laughing. We said, oh, 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 we should send them a loaf of our bread. <laughs> <laughs> to pay off your debt. And, you know, <laughs> that, um, so I applied for a job. So I come in and I have still wanting a little fashion. I got.